Welcome back. We're now talking about projections and what's called the proximal operator. And also, we're going to move a little bit outside of the black box model, the Oracle model, which we've essentially been talking about so far. So for our problem, minimize f of x, so far every algorithm that we've seen, gradient descent, the subgradient method, accelerated gradient descent, all these have used are evaluations of the function and evaluations of the gradient. But when we started talking about uh, convex optimization, there was another important component. We spent almost equal time talking about convex functions as convex sets, and, and we have yet to see the appearance of, of convex sets. This is where the concept of projection comes in, and it gives us a natural formulation of, uh, of an algorithm, a naturally adapts gradient descent. So the picture is, as the name suggests, if this is this is x, my convex, my convex set, if I ever end up moving outside of x because of gradient descent, this is xt, and this is xt minus my gradient step, then a natural concept is to apply a projection operator back onto the set. This is a natural algorithm, and it's called projected gradient descent. So the formulation this takes is xt plus 1 is equal to the projection onto x of my gradient step, xt minus eta, gradient of f of xt. The first thing we should see here is that this projection operator is something, again, that is outside of our Oracle model. In other words, in order to go from xt to xt plus 1, we need to perform this, we need to perform this additional step. So in this sense, we're moving slightly away from the, from, the pure, from the pure Oracle model. What we want to know is, do we, and we've done all of this work talking about acceleration, talking about rates of convergence for gradient descent, do we need to repeat everything um, now that we're going to incorporate this projection? Well, the good news is that we don't have to do this. And along the way, we'll see that projection is just a special case of something called the proximal operator, which is going to be very useful for us to greatly expand the kind of functions that we're able to treat and give guarantees for. Let's uh, go back to one of, our earlier, uh, one of our earlier lectures on rates of convergence, where we looked at the subgradient method. In other words, where we looked at minimizing f of x, where f is convex, and all we know is that we have an upper bound on the subgradient of, of f. Now, let's very quickly um, look at the proof of, of, of convergence here. Hopefully, it'll feel good to see, uh, to see an old friend again after, after all of the other more complicated things that we've done. So again, our algorithm was xt plus 1 is equal to xt minus eta times gt, where gt is an element of the subdifferential of xt. And remember that subgradient method is not a descent algorithm. So we didn't, unlike, our, uh, unlike algorithms um, for smooth functions, gradient descent for smooth functions, where we started looking at f of xt minus f of xt plus 1, or f of xt minus f of x star, what ends up being a uh, what ends up being a good measure of progress is how far away we are from, from, from x star. And so we started out, the way that our proof proceeds is looking at xt plus 1 minus x star. Again, I'll go through this a little bit quickly since we've seen it, we've seen it before. This is equal to, as usual, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to plug in for what xt plus 1 is. This is equal to xt minus a to gt minus x star squared. I'll expand the square. This is equal to xt minus x star squared, twice the cross term, 
gt times xt minus x star plus eta squared times gt squared. So this is what's upper bounded by capital G squared. That's, our, that's the main assumption here. Now this in turn is less than or equal to, again, if you remember what we've done so far in this class, you'll know where this, uh, where this comes from, f of xt minus f of x star. I'll give you a second. So this is basic, the basic convex, uh, convex property, bounding the difference of two function, the difference of f of xt and f of x star by the linear approximation at xt plus eta squared g squared. Um, and rearranging, we saw that, so in particular, moving, uh, moving this term here over to the left-hand side and, moving, uh, and, and then moving uh, xt plus 1 minus x squared over to the right and doing a little bit of, of algebra of completing the square, we got that f of xt minus f of x star less than 1 over 2 eta times xt minus x star squared minus xt plus 1 minus x star squared plus eta over 2 times g squared. This eta, this eta over 2 came because I divided eta squared by 2 eta. Okay, and then we saw our old friend, the telescoping term. We summed, and we were, we were, and we were happy. Okay. Now, what's different now when we look at projected gradient descent? So let's add all our projected, everything that relates to a projected term in a different color. So I want to minimize f of x subject to x in my convex set x. So I need to now modify my algorithm. I need, to, um, I need to modify my algorithm in the following way. xt plus 1 is not any longer going to be xt minus eta gt. It'll be the projection of that. So let me write this in two steps. So let me write y t plus 1 as my, gradient, as my subgradient step. And then xt plus 1 will just be the projection onto x of yt plus 1. So now let's see how this changes the proof that we saw below. Well, looking down here, we see that what we used, in particular, what I used in this very first step here, is xt plus 1 I wrote out as a function of xt. And that's no longer the case. So in order to make sure that this holds, I need to replace xt plus 1 with yt plus 1. If I do that, then everything is good. xt plus 1 minus x, minus x star squared. Indeed, yt plus 1 is equal to xt minus eta gt. And everything proceeds. I just need to replace wherever I see xt... Uh, Wherever I see xt plus 1, I need to replace with yt plus 1. And that appears in one other place down here. So now we no longer have something telescoping because I have xt minus x star minus yt plus 1 minus x star, not xt plus 1. However, fortunately, what do we have here? yt plus 1 is equal to the projection onto x of, oops, the other way around, uh, xt plus 1 is equal to the projection onto x of yt plus 1. Also, x star is in x. So if I start in x and I project onto x, I just get back itself. So I can write x star as the projection onto x of x star. And therefore, I can replace yt plus 1 minus x star, what do we know about this quantity compared to the quantity xt plus 1 minus x star? Doesn't matter, we can, we can square it. How are these related? 
So remember, we showed that for any two points that you take, if you project them onto the convex set, the distance between the projection points is, greater than, is less than or equal to the distance between the original points. So in other words, this inequality is satisfied. So let's see what this does for me. I want to replace yt plus 1 here with xt plus 1. And what this inequality tells me is that xt plus 1 minus x star, xt plus 1 minus x star is less than or equal to yt plus 1 minus x star. So that means I'm going to subtract less. That means, let me put all of this in parentheses so it's not confusing. So that means that I've got an inequality here in the right direction. It's less than or equal to 1 over 2 eta times xt minus x star minus, and now instead of yt plus 1, I can write again xt plus 1 minus x star, thanks to what we had shown about projection. And then everything goes through exactly as we had before. So we can see here that we get the same rates I might as well finish it, I guess. So what do we, what do we have? Um, we've got that f of 1 over t times the average of xt minus f of x star is less than or equal to 1 over 2 eta times t times r squared. r squared is going to be the distance between our initial point and the optimal point squared, plus eta over 2 g squared. And so again, exactly as before, this is, this, is, this is unchanged, we find that we have a convergence of 1 over square root of t. So this was re relatively painless. We essentially got this for free. Now let's think about what we, what we can do in, in a more general context, in addition to just thinking about smooth and strongly convex, because I promised you that I wasn't going to just reprove everything that we've done over and over again. So I want to think more generally about the projection and the prox operator. Because you'd be very correct to say, isn't there a better way that we could, we could write this? So note that if I, when I have minimize f of x subject to x in a convex set, I could equally well write this equivalently as minimize f of x plus this function that is equal to plus infinity whenever I'm outside of x and is equal to 0 inside of x. This is called the indicator function. I'll write down exactly, I'll write it down precisely in a, in a moment. I could equally write this, and now with, with no constraints, where this is called the indicator function. I should note that in other areas of mathematics, the indicator function may mean something different. So in some cases, the indicator function takes the value 1 on the set and 0 elsewhere, but that's not the case here. The indicator function is defined as plus infinity if x is not in x and 0 if x is in x. In other words, it's saying, hey, as long as you choose x and x, I'm going to leave you alone. I'm not going to change, I'm not going to change the value. But you better not go outside of, outside, of my set, outside of the set x. That's why these two things are, are equivalent. And you can check that this is, in fact, a convex function. But it's not smooth. So we could just minimize this. using our usual subgradient descent, subgradient method, not descent, rather than using projected subgradient, which, was just, which we just saw. So this is, uh, this is, this is definitely an option that we could, um, that we could choose. Um, so my note here, again, is that projected subgradient versus subgradient method on my new function. And call this, I'm going to introduce a word in a little bit called composite function. That means it's the sum of these two 
of these two different terms. So this is an important thing to, uh, to, to think about. But we're dealing, in the proof that we just saw, we're dealing with uh, projection directly. We're, not, we're, uh, we're dealing with a projection step, in other words, with, with this uh, indicator function directly rather than also dealing with that through uh, indicator functions. Okay, so one observation about this indicator function, looking at it a little bit more, a little more carefully, we see the following. That my projection onto my set X of some point, I can also write it as the argument that minimizes the indicator function plus one half times u minus x. So this is the minimization over u. Now why is that? Well, again, this indicator function, we saw that this is equivalent to just putting this directly as a constraint. So this is the argument of one half u minus x subject to x to subject to u in x. And this is our definition of projection. So the projection operator is equal to the argument of my indicator function plus this term, a term that tells me to not to go too far away, to stay as close as possible as I can to x, while also trying to minimize, trying to minimize ix, the indicator. So we're going to take this idea and generalize it. So we will generalize this to other functions, convex functions, other than just the identity. So here is the key definition of the prox operator. Prox is, stands for proximal. For H, an arbitrary convex function The proximal operator, denoted by prox subscript h of y, is equal to the argument of h of x, this is the min over x, plus 1 half times x minus y squared. So it's saying, given y, try to minimize h of x, but also don't go too far, don't stray too far from y. That's what the second term, or proximal term, is telling us. And a slight modification of this, or expansion of this definition, also sneaks in another constant. It's the prox of eta h. And eta, just as before, is going to play the role of a step size, but we'll see that in a, in a moment. Prox eta h of y is equal to the argument for x of h of x plus 1 over 2 eta times x minus y. To see why it plays the role of a step size, think about what happens when eta is very, very small. Well, when eta is very, very small, this second term here, the coefficient in front of it explodes because I have 1 over eta. And so this minimization is going to care a lot more about staying very, very close to y. In other words, wherever it will go will be closer to y because it cares about, about that term. On the other hand, when eta becomes huge, this, this, this term at the end basically vanishes and you might end up taking a very big, a very big step. All you care about is minimizing, is minimizing h. So now it's time to define the proximal gradient algorithm. And again, it's useful to draw our intuition from projected gradient descent. So our projected gradient descent was x t plus 1 equals the projection onto x of my gradient step, x t minus eta times subgradient, or I'll just write the gradient of the function. So the natural generalization of this 
the proximal gradient descent algorithm tells me that xt plus 1 is equal to prox eta h of xt minus eta, gradient of f of xt. And again, the note here from the last two slides is that if h is equal to the indicator function, then the proximal operator, this is what we derived, of a to h is just equal to projection. And therefore, proximal gradient descent turns into just projected gradient descent. But for different h, we don't necessarily have this. Again, notice the, uh, the subtitle of this, of this slide, moving away from the Oracle model of computation. Each iteration here requires, first of all, evaluation of f, or rather the gradient of f, and evaluation of the prox operator. So we're going to see, first of all, where this is useful, why we might want to do this. We're going to see that in the next, in the next slides. But for now, I just want to make sure that we all understand that we're moving away from what we had, what we had before. And so we may expect to see results that are potentially better than the guarantees we found from the, uh, from the lower bounds. So before we go into too much detail, let's just uh, see some examples of proximal operators. So maybe the, most, um, maybe the most useful for us, and one of the central motivations for developing proximal gradient um, came from this function f of x is just the L1 norm. So let's uh, try to, divide, to, to, uh, to derive what, this, um, what the prox operator is for, for, this, for this function. So the prox of eta f of x, I'm just writing out all, all the definitions here, is equal to my function f of x, which in this case is just the one norm of x, plus 1 over 2 eta times, sorry here, we need, to, we need to move things around a little bit. I'm not being careful. Um, so we're minimizing, uh, this is the, the prox operator is the argument over u of the L1 norm of u plus 1 over 2 eta times u minus x squared. You can see that this particular thing is a balance between the one norm and the two norm. In general, this is what the proximal operator does. It, minimize, it, it balances between trying to minimize your function f or minimize your function h and this proximal term that we have, uh, we have at the end. OK, well, we know how to solve optimization problems, or we know a thing or two about that by now. Um, let's start by looking at a characterization of optimality. So if u is the optimal solution, U is the optimal solution to this is equivalent to writing that zero is an element of the subdifferential of the one norm plus the subdifferential of the second term, but the subdifferential contains one unique point, which is which is just the gradient, because that second point, that second part here is is uh, is differentiable. So this is just one over eta times u minus x. Rearranging, this is like saying that x minus u is an element of eta times my subdifferential of u. Now let's remember what the subdifferential is of the uh, L1 norm. So remember that the subdifferential of u is equal to the sine, let's say the ith, let me write it a bit more carefully here. If uh, z 
is in the subdifferential of u, then zi is equal to the sine of ui, in other words, plus 1 or minus 1, if ui is different from 0, and it's equal to anything, some element of minus 1 to 1, if ui is equal to 0. So let's see what this gives us. So back to this, x minus u is an element of eta times the subdifferential of u at 1. You can check that what this implies is that u has to be such that ui is equal to xi minus eta if xi is greater than eta, 0 if xi is less than or equal to eta in absolute value, and xi plus eta if xi is less than minus eta. So what does this do in other words? It pulls you by eta wherever you are, every coordinate, it pulls it by eta towards the origin. Unless you're within eta of the origin, in which case you just go directly to the origin. So as an example here, the prox of, let's just take eta equal to 1, of f, for f this function, of the vector 2 minus 1 half minus 3, what would this be? We go coordinate by coordinate. The first coordinate, 2, it's more than 1, which is what my eta is, away from uh, the origin, so it shrinks to 1. Minus 1 half is less than 1 away from 0, so it goes to 0. And minus 3 goes to minus 2. Okay, so it, it basically pulls everything towards the origin. This is sometimes called the soft thresholding operator. Uh, and it's also sometimes called shrinkage for kind of, obvious, um, kind of obvious reasons. Okay, let's see a few other examples, but this is kind of one of the, one of the primary ones that we're, going to, um, that we're going to use. Other examples of procs. I won't do all the calculations for, uh, for all of these. So if f of x is equal to 1 half x transpose qx plus q transpose x plus a constant q0, so just a quadratic, convex quadratic, then check as an exercise that the prox eta f is equal to identity plus eta times q inverse times x minus eta q. So checking this is really all that amounts to is just setting up the minimization and deriving it. And because it's a quadratic and a convex quadratic, all you need to do is just take the gradient and set it equal to 0 and solve, and you'll immediately get this. So check by using the definitions. These are harder to check whenever we have something that we need to reason about, something that, that's like, that, that doesn't have um, an, a, 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 a derivative that we can compute um, easily. So another point to make, so another more general class of examples is uh, separable functions. So if f of x is equal to the sum of fi of xi, then, and again, this is something that you should check for yourselves just to make sure that you understand the basic definitions, the proximal operator actually decomposes over every individual coordinate. So in other words, if I look at the proximal operator of f, evaluated out of vector x, this again is a vector. It's a prox is an operator. It's not a function. If you input a d-dimensional vector, you get a d-dimensional vector. The ith element of this is equal to prox evaluated on function fi of coordinate xi. So this is very useful um, 
for problems where you have this decomposition. It basically tells you that you can easily parallelize the computation of the proximal operator. And again, a simple example is what we did on the previous page of f of x equal to the L1 norm. The L1 norm is exactly a function of this, of this form. And let me give you a final fact just for, uh, just for fun. Here's something that is useful when, when, when using uh, proximal algorithms on, uh, on the dual. This is called the Moreau decomposition. And it says, let f star of y be the fenchel legendre transform. In other words, f star of y is equal to the supremum over x of inner product of y with x minus f of x. The Fenchel transform has a lot of special properties, lots of uses in convex optimization and convex analysis. We're not going to talk about that now. Then x is equal to the prox operator of f plus the prox operator of the Fenchel transform. And if you want to get a little bit of intuition of this, you can try to prove it directly. But also, just remember the connection to projection. And this should give you a little bit of intuition about what this is trying to do, what this kind of decomposition is saying. Um, so remember that any point I can write as its projection onto an affine, uh, onto, a, onto, a, onto a linear space, plus the projection of, its point, of, of that point onto the perpendicular complement. We're now going to talk about um, where this is, where this is uh, applied. And the key term here that we're introducing is called composite functions. So, so far, we've been talking about minimizing f of x. And again, we've been in the Oracle model. All we're using is gradients of f. But, but now I'm going to look a little bit more carefully and suppose that f of x is actually the sum of g of x plus h of x, where g of x is smooth, and h of x has an easy to evaluate prox operator. A key motivation here is this thing called lasso, which is really uh, another word for L1 regularized regression. I want to minimize function f of x, which is equal to maybe some constants, x. Let me stick with writing x's instead of, uh, instead of betas. So, uh, minus ax minus y squared plus the L1 norm. So it's important to look at a few things here. Note that um, this is smooth, but this is like our absolute value function, so it's not smooth. If I were to just simply look back at everything we've done so far and ask, how quickly can I solve this function? Well, the best that we could promise is this is a non-smooth function. I have to use subgradient method, so I would get one over squared of one over squared of t convergence. On the other hand, you see that this is really a smooth function plus this easy non-smooth function, and that's exactly the idea behind proximal gradient. If we we want to recover the faster convergence rate for the smooth part, or smooth and strongly convex part, when we have a non-smooth but somehow easy, in the sense of an easy prox operator, function h. So this is going to be our key motivation for, um, for, uh, for proximal gradient descent. We're going to stop here and pick that up next time.